Welcome to another edition of our online chapel series. You know, there's a lot of confusing things going on in our world today, and sometimes it makes it difficult for us to make good, biblically-based, Christ-centered decisions regarding how we go about our lives. So this week, our president, Dr. Heath Thomas, is leading a panel discussion on a Christ-centered perspective of cultural intelligence. Our panelists include Reverend Anthony Rohn, a local pastor, Misael Gonzalez, a recent graduate and a teaching pastor at FBC Owasso, and our very own Dr. Hepzibah Dutt. I want to challenge you, after watching this video, make it a point to keep the conversation going. Let's be a community that's first of all known by our love for one another, so that whether we agree or disagree with other points of view, we would above all things be patient, kind, and loving to one another, just as Christ has called us to. And let that be the mark of our character as we move forward in the difficult days ahead. All right, well, I bring you greetings from Bison Hill. It's great to have you uh, on this chapel service uh, where we're having a conversation today, talking with our esteemed uh, panel about some of the challenges we're facing, not only as a student body and as a university community, but it also reaches more widely out into our world. Uh, we're facing a world, as I've said before, it seems like the world is at war with itself. And as a follower of Jesus, all of us here are uh, committed followers of Jesus. One of the things that we're trying to look at is, number one, how can we live under the lordship of Jesus uh, most faithfully in our world today with all of the challenges and the social unrest and the racial unrest that we are seeing today? How do we faithfully live out uh, the lordship of Jesus in our communities? How do we do that well at OBU? How do we do that well in uh, the city where God has placed us or the region that God has placed us? And uh, how do we represent him in our world so that not only we follow Jesus' command to love our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but we also love our neighbor as ourselves. And at OBU, one of the things that we want to do very well is we want to love God, but we also want to love our neighbor. The second thing is followers of Jesus, we want to not only love God and love our neighbor, but where we treat one another badly, or whether we, uh, as, as a people, uh, commit injustice against another uh, group of people or another uh, one in the community. One of the things that we want to do very, very faithfully is to heed the words of Micah 6, 8. And the prophet Micah, uh, uh, by God, was, was given this charge and this command to give to the people of Israel. Uh, you, he has told you, God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to, and I love this, he, he says to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. So where we commit injustice against one another as followers of Jesus, we want to pursue justice, pursue loving mercy and humility before our God. And I'm grateful for our panel because these are three friends that actually do that. They, they love God and they love their neighbor uh, very well. And uh, I, I know you're all committed to uh, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So thank you so much for being uh, here for this conversation. And let me introduce uh, this panel uh, to you uh, and to the viewers. So I'm Heath Thomas. I'm the president uh, of o OBU. I'm also a professor of Old Testament. Uh, immediately to my left is uh, Dr. Hepzibah Dutt. She is uh, assistant professor and, uh, and director of the theater here at OBU. Dr. Dutt, welcome. Great to have you. Beside her, I have the esteemed pastor, Tony Roan, who's a great friend to me and a great friend to OBU. Uh, he is the pastor of Galilee Baptist Church, where a number of our students and a number of our community uh, actually attend. So, Dr. Roan, thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful to have you here. And then uh, to the far, far left is uh, Misael Gonzalez, who's one of our, he's our, one of our spring 2020 graduates uh, at, uh, from OBU. And right now he's serving as uh, on the pastoral staff at First Baptist Church Owasso. And uh, he was a great leader at OBU. He was in Hobbs College and a great leader in Hobbs College and a great leader uh, of our students. So we're thrilled to have him here to have this conversation. So uh, panel, welcome, and I'm ready to get going. Are you? Is that okay? 
All right, so as we think about our world, we do see a, a world, as I've said, uh, it seems at war with itself. Racial tensions, racial unrest, racial injustice is an order of our day. We see it expressed on the nightly news. Uh, many in our community experience it on a firsthand basis. And uh, what we're wanting to do is uh, not only hear the words of Jesus, but actually open the conversation in a constructive way. Now, I did my PhD training in the UK, and uh, one of the great things that I've learned uh, while I was there is uh, this wonderful phrase. Sometimes in our conversations, as we add and contribute to the conversation, we generate a lot of heat, but not much light. And I think when we talk about these conversations, boy, there is a lot of heat, but unfortunately, sometimes there's not just much, there, there's not a lot of light. So in our conversation, one of the things that we, we aim to do together is not just contrib contribute more fire, right, but actually contribute light to the conversation so that we can all be helped. And one of the things that we need help with is just getting the conversation going. How do we prepare ourselves for a conversation about a racial injustice, about this, this, the story, the history of racism in America, about uh, maybe internal prejudice and uh, unconscious bias that we have in our own hearts and in our own lives. And, and uh, you know, it's a tough conversation. And so, you know, Dr. Dutt, how do we get a purchase on this? How do we prepare ourselves for this conversation? Oh, gosh, thank you. I will be happy to start. <laughs> uh, this is a lot from my own experience, so I'm not just going off of textbooks here, but uh, from having to be on both sides of uh, being treated as a minority, but also recognizing my privilege in different groups. So I've been on both sides and just uh, happy to share some of the things I've learned uh, when we approach these topics. Thank you. I think one of the most important things to recognize for me is that there is a historical structure, historical perspective to racial injustice. Uh, it didn't just emerge this past summer. It just jumped into the limelight is all. So I think remembering that we are products of our personal histories, that we are products of um, the voices that built us just the same way, and in the same way our communities are products of history and uh, the shape, the laws, the ru rulers, nations that you know govern laws built the communities we live in today. All this to say, we're part of a bigger story and we're in the middle of it right now. So when we start these conversations and you have these really hard feelings come up, right? Um, we talk about racial injustice and depending on which side, either side, you could experience guilt and fear and shame and very often anger, anger which leads us to being dismissive, anger which leads us to um, writing off a person's suffering or experience. And I think in those moments when you experience these really heavy and hard feelings as we start talking about privilege, one of the first things to do is breathe and remind yourself, this is a story that started a long time ago and I'm still in the middle of it. And these are the hard chapters that we have to get through uh, and just be happy, allow yourself the grace of recognizing this isn't you. This isn't a personal thing that you did or that your family did, but we are all in this big story together. Um, I think it's also so important to listen sincerely, uh, whether or not you agree, to sit and listen uh, and hear someone at, talk out of their own experience. That's one of the other things I, I found to be very important as well. So. Yeah, and isn't it an important thing? Uh, I like very much what you said. It's okay if we disagree. Uh, as, as a community at OBU, one of the, the key components of our education is we want to be critical thinkers. Critical thinkers don't always agree with someone who holds a different view than we. But as critical thinkers, we respect the other person. One of my friends says it this way, we, if we're engaging in a conversation with someone and we disagree on an idea, then we always go to the jugular of an idea, but we never go to the jugular of another person. As followers of Jesus, we're called to a different standard, right? We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we could disagree on a concept or an idea, 
but we should never be dismissive about another person, their experience, what they're going through. We should hear them in all of their uh, singularity of their experience. And I think that's an, that's an important point. Um, yeah, go ahead. And I was just going to say, and this is why uh, I love what we're doing here today, because we're coming at this from a biblical worldview. And I think we understand that we are speaking to people that claim to be transformed by the grace of God, that we are speaking to born-again believers, and, and I think that we should expect more from born-again believers, from transformed and restored hearts. And as we begin to talk about this conversation, it's one of those things that in order to walk into this, we have to understand a couple things. We have to understand that there are some blind spots in our lives. And we see this in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46. You have Jesus walking with his disciples, and there's blind Bartimaeus on the side. And in this moment, in this passage, you see a person who's completely blind physically and spiritually. But then you keep reading, and you see that these disciples, they have some blind spots. That they're walking with the Lord, and as Bartimaeus is crying out to Jesus, these disciples are saying, shut up. That's a blind spot. And so as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to, have to understand that we do have to walk humbly, understanding we have blind spots. Because as we read the scriptures, I mean, I, I keep in mind Psalms chapter 8, where it says that the Lord has set his glory in the heavens. And you keep on reading down and it says that he has crowned humanity with his glory. Crowned humanity with his glory. And as we think about that, how in the world can I look at someone and not see the handiwork of the Lord? How can I not see them and say, Lord, you are so great. You have crowned them with your glory, and they proclaim your glory. And then the third thing, as we walk into this conversation, I hope that we don't elevate racism over sin and say, hey, I'd much rather declare that I'm a sinner than to be racist, uh, because really we're just talking about sin and, and, the, and the, the sin in our hearts. And so I want to make sure that as we go into this conversation, we keep those things in mind uh, because I'd hope that we would walk humbly and be okay with saying, yeah, I have a blind spot in that and we need to talk about this. Yeah, and I appreciate that. So let's do talk about sin, okay? As followers of Jesus, we do believe what the scripture teaches, that sin is real and where there's sin, it breaks uh, our relationship with God, obviously, sin um, separates us from communion with God, and there's absolutely uh, truth to that. We also see that in, for instance, the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they broke that relationship with God, but then they start the blame game. They blame one another, so it breaks our relationship, and this is very important. It breaks our relationship with one another. So where there was communion not only with God and with one another, now there's contention between us and God and contention between uh us and our, our fellow human beings. Uh, we also see that sin, if you look in the garden, sin, they, they hide. Well, why do Adam and Eve hide in the garden once they've eaten the, the uh, fruit and, and they've known their own sin, their mortality? It's because sin actually warps and breaks our relationship with ourselves. We can call this self-image, we can call this psyche, but somehow where there was wholeness, now there's shame. And uh, there's this breaking there. And then, as well, there's, there's a, a, a rupture between us and our world. What happens to Adam and Eve? They go east of Eden out into the land of thorns and thistles. And so now that sin has entered into the world, there's breach between communion with God, with one another, with self, and with our world. That seems like a pretty holistic picture of the impact of sin in our lives. So sin doesn't just uh, put a frown on God's otherwise happy face. Sin doesn't just, uh, you know, make my heart uh, sad. Sin is real, and it creates ruptures, not only in my relationship with God, but also in our communities, uh, so that sin manifests itself in uh, various ways. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Is that really true? Does sin really work itself out in our communities? Is that really a thing? Uh, Dr. Dutt, and then I want to hear from Pastor Roan, because I know you've got a perspective on this too. Shall we start with Pastor Roan? Sure, that'd be great. 
I think it definitely does. Again, he thank you for let, uh, allowing me to be here. But I think sin definitely does work itself out, obviously in the world and in our communities and even in our in our churches. Um, it's sad to say that, but it's true. Um, the effect of sin doesn't stop at the door of the, at the door of the church. It enters in in the hearts of those who who are who are part of that church, though we are in the process of being redeemed from that sin, obviously. Um, and I think, as I've stated to our church, if there is any blame to be placed upon the continuing issues of race that we see in our culture, in our society, and even in the church, um, the church has to take the major blame for that. Wow. That's a big statement. Yeah, the church has to take the major blame for the racism we see in our culture because God, one of God's purposes for the church is to bring those two men together so that they're no longer two, but that they're one. That's right. And it's sad to say that what we've seen, especially here in these United States over the years, is, let's just be honest, a white church and a minority church and uh, learning how to fuse those two together so that we mirror what Christ wants us to mirror as the church is the work that we have to engage in to overcome the effects of sin that have even entered into the church. That's powerful. And so what you're saying, it sounds like to me, if I'm hearing you rightly, is yes, sin can work itself out in our communities. Sin can work itself out in our church. And where the church should stand up and be the different message, the different voice, the different people united in Christ, we might have given a different word. Yeah. Uh, but we know this happens in our, in our societies, in our communities as well. So oh, yeah, can you speak yeah. a little bit more to that? Sure. Um, so sin in our societies, I think often when we hear the word racism, we start thinking about individual acts of sin, right? And so that's very easy for us to exonerate. Most of us, we're you know, good Christian kids brought up, in, brought up in good Christian homes. We're not going around burning crosses in anyone's yards or calling people the N-word, right? So it's really easy for us to think, oh, no, I'm not racist. Yeah, that's somebody racist, else. It's somebody yeah. else. It's not part of my life or my community. Whereas what we're learning and learning to identify and name is that sis systematic racism or sin, we're talking about uh, sin has taken shape in the form of the system's that govern our societies. Um, I, I, I would love to nerd out about this in a historical perspective, but if you wanna find me sometime, we can talk about it more. But um, if we look at just the history of America, we know that since the 1960s and after civil rights, the way systems were put in place in terms of policing, housing, education, and access to education and health are some of the ways the sin has entered systems. We've created structures, systematic structures that govern our lives, govern education, govern our access to health, um, lending practices, mortgaging practices that became racialized. Uh, and so you see communities that over the last 60 years developed under the privilege of not being burdened by certain racial systems, and then there are communities that were affected by lending practices that were racialized, by uh, segregation in schools, again, a racialized system, um, segregation in housing or housing opportunity, access to education and scholarships, and these things were set in place years and years ago, decades ago, and are having their, and had effects over the last 60 years that continue to accumulate and grow, and. When I think about this and learn more about this, to me there is nothing more sinful. Um, it, it's, it's darkness at its very worst because it's hidden in systems that we trust and rely on. Uh, we trust and rely on these systems to lend order to our life. Um, legal systems, judicial systems, they have become heavily racialized and to the point that we look at them and think of them as normal. Right. And uh, Honestly, something you said, Misael, you said some about being held to another standard, right, as Christians, as people who claim to be transformed by the love of Jesus. And this is where I look at these systems and I think we should be filled with a holy discontent. Uh, it's so easy for us to say unity and think, oh yeah, we're all one in Christ, but unity isn't a feeling. 
It isn't uh, just an emotion. It is a state of being, a state of being whole, and to be unified in Christ means that we need to be discontent that the sin of inequalities exist in the systems around us. And the, the powerful point on this uh, that I hear right uh, just in my own life is this manifests itself not just out there somewhere, not just hidden in our systems, but it can happen in the church. And it reminds me of James, and this is just one example where we can uh, say we're, one person is more important than another. One person gets access, the other person doesn't. When James is talking to the church and he says, this rich person comes in and you say to the poor person, get out of the way so this person of prestige who deserves it can get there. I mean, that seems to me a small example of what we're talking about more broadly in our society. Some people uh, in, in our blind spots and our, our prejudice, we might say, well, they, they deserve more. This person doesn't. So we'll put this person to the side and not think about them anymore. But this person or this group of people, we'll take good care of them. And I think that's why I come the church has to take the role. I mean, we are immersed more in our sinful culture than we are in the church as far as time and exposure. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're exposed to racism in our culture. We may not see it as such, but we see the ideology there of what racism is. We see that in our culture. And if we're not careful, we can think from that example out of the book of James that you just given, if that's the way the culture is for those of us that are in the church who haven't grown in this process of sanctification and understanding, that's not okay. To treat somebody who has um, substance or wealth more, more importantly than the person that doesn't. I mean, that's not okay. We may see that in the world, but we don't see that. We shouldn't see that in the church. And so it becomes our job in the church as pastors, as leaders in the church, to demonstrate uh, not just from the scriptures, but in the lives of those who are part of the church. You know, we come to church, we spend time, we, we do these things together in, in the realms of the church. And I think it's either strict, I think it's in the book, or uh, maybe this is in Perkins, I've read this from Perkins, that we have closeness, but we don't have fellowship. So we come to church each and every Sunday, we worship, we sing, we spend time in the confines of the church, but outside of that church, we don't have this fellowship, this getting to know each other, this sitting across the table this understanding this person. And I think until that happens, until we can really flesh that out in the church, under the auspices of the gospel, we're not, as you said, we're not gonna agree. We're not gonna agree on everything, on issues that we may talk about in this, in this, in this, in this fellowship, but we can agree to be disagreeable and still love each other. We can speak the truth in love, right? We can still do that and still be brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as churches for all people of all races, of all sexes, to be able to come together and uniquely and organically demonstrate that we are what we're supposed to be, this diverse community of Christ saved believers. And that's, that's, that's exactly right. And I want to talk in a minute about what, how the gospel works itself out in the church so that we yeah. become that. Yeah. But to get there, we have to deal with uh, maybe a new kind of normal for our, for our community, for the church. Uh, normal for us oftentimes is informed by our background, uh, our language, our community, uh, our ethnicity, that's normal for us uh, in whoever the us, quote unquote, is. But for the followers of Jesus, maybe we need to recalibrate what the normal actually is. And you were sharing with us uh, uh, just a, a little while ago an experience that you had in your church uh, or, or maybe with a student or something where this idea of maybe a new normal is what we need, that, that came really clearly to light in your own experience. So talk about that a little bit and then share with us a little bit about your heart on what would be a new normal for us. Yeah. I'm so grateful for your wisdom. I'm so grateful and I love hearing from you guys. So I hope you guys are enjoying what they're having to say. Uh, the story I shared with them earlier uh, is a true story that happened to me just a couple weeks ago. 
I was walking and I, and I was talking to a youth student. And this youth student was trying to wrestle with the fact that, that I'm, I'm at his church and I'm a bilingual teaching pastor. And he asked me a question that I've never heard before. And he said, Misael, so you're telling me that you speak Spanish and human? I don't think you heard me right. Spanish and human? Wow. And it was in that moment I took a step back and I said, <laughs> okay, let's, let's have a little conversation real quick. Let's have a conversation as two human beings who are communicating with each other in English. But if you need me to communicate with you in Spanish, I definitely can. And, you know, there's people in this world that communicate in other languages. And isn't, how, isn't that amazing how God has made us be that we can communicate even without sounds? We can use sign language. And so there's this moment in this teaching moment with this youth student of saying, look, to be human doesn't mean just to speak English. To be human doesn't mean just to be white. To be human doesn't just mean to be American. Uh, and so this is a, a true story that blew me away. Uh, but I think it... it, it it really deals with that question that you're asking, what do we mean by normal? Because when we look into the world, when we look into our society, even our churches, there seems to be this normal and then everyone else. And to be normal seems to be English-speaking, American, white, and that's what it means. Because some of us are Mexican, some of us are African-American, some of us are Native American. And we have these people come up to us and say, well, you know, you're not like a real Mexican. You know, you, you speak English and, and you know, you, you have a car you can drive and you have a home and you have a family. And, and you, you know, you're not poor and you're not this. And it's like, so you're telling me that to be normal is, is to have all these things and to speak English? And it just doesn't make sense. And so when we think of a new normal is is maybe we should think that maybe diversity is not the goal because diversity means variety. Maybe the goal should be equity of we're, we're, not, we're not being diverse for diverse sake, but we are diverse and we're looking at each other with a value and saying that you are worth in the eyes of the Lord and, 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 and you are worth in my eyes. And I see your background. I see how you're, that you're different from me. And that's awesome. We're going to learn from each other. But the goal is that equity. Uh, and so I, when I think of that, um, man, I would love for us to see each other with that equity as humans. Well, thank you for that. And Dr. Dutt, I'd be interested to know, I just respond a little bit to what yeah. uh, Misael is saying because uh, this is powerful. Yeah, yeah, gosh, your story. Misael, first of all, God bless you for just taking that situation with so much grace. I think the Spirit must have been really with you to give you so much patience and uh, compassion on that student that you were talking to in that moment because essentially what he said could have been so dehumanizing which is violent right it's someone taking stripping you of this beautiful thing that God made you in his image I think uh, events like this uh, in the nerdy term being microaggressions happen um, constantly so when we talk about microaggressions they are uh, occurrences that happen in daily life. They're acts of aggression against people that are sometimes intentional, but very often in unintentional, where you look at someone and you measure them by your standard of living, by your values, by your experiences, and then end up speaking to them um, out of your lens, uh, making sure that you've set them apart unintentionally, either, e either intentionally or unintentionally setting them apart by derogatory comments, stereotypes, um, making it really clear you don't see that person as yourself, as a, on the same level, you know, not the same person um, or same group. And these ha uh, this happens um, for, I think, any person of minority, especially those who have to live and conduct, conduct their life amongst the majority culture. So. I'm guessing any minority student on this campus. Uh, I was a minority student on a Christian liberal arts college in Iowa and experienced situations like yours a lot. Um, it is one of the ways that we can, when we talk about uncovering our own individual sins when it comes to racism, be very careful about and, and acknowledge that we are shaped by, by our societies, by our stories, um, by people who tell us who cons constitutes human or valuable human or not. And 
uh, I want to just say that if you end up in a community where everybody looks like you, talks like you, enjoys the same jokes as you, enjoys watching the same things, listening to the same music, you are probably in an echo chamber where the same narratives that you believe in come back at you and therefore you don't have the opportunity to grow or even notice when you are one of those people who goes through the world accidentally hurting your brothers and sisters because you measure them, comment to them about their appearance, their hair, their looks, their choices, the way they smell, the things they listen to, um, comment upon their humanity through your lens um, in hurtful ways. And, and um, so I, if I could tell something to students right now about avoiding this situation, it would be, look around you. If everyone around you looks like you, sounds like you, listens to the same music, watches the same things, you are in an echo chamber and you should break out because you won't grow there. You won't. That's a good word. Okay, so thank you for Heath, can uh, I say, sharing can I that. Say yeah, please do. Quick. I think uh, uh, in addition to the uh, great things that both of you all have said, I think <clears throat> the realization that in these United States, it has been the dominant culture that pretty much we think has set the standard for what is right and for what is acceptable. I think the beauty of diversity and equity is to challenge that and to really confront that with truth, with God's truth, because we all bear the image of God, not just uh, white male. Yes, and unpack that for us. Yeah. The image of God is not just localized, it's, as you say, in a white male. It's, it's not. Talk about that. God yeah. created humanity. Talk about that. That's the right. image of God. That's right. God created humanity, and every, every person made in the image of God bears part of God. Not the fullness of God, but we bear part of God. Those things that could be communicated to us, we bear that. And you don't have to be from America, obviously. Wherever God has created individuals and placed them at different epochs of time and different seasons and different places, God's in control of all of that. And all of those individuals bear the image of God. And so that gives them value and gives them worth, not just the skin color or a cultural thing. It, it's because we all bear the image of God that we have worth. And so to overcome that, because again, sometimes we can think that the majority culture or the majority race are the ones who set, set the standards for what's right and what's acceptable. And I think what, again, what diversity and equity brings to the table is to say, no, it calls us back to God's design for humanity, for all of humanity, not one segment of humanity, but for all of humanity. And so in regards to, to the church, it becomes our job on a, on, a, on, a, on a weekly basis for those of us who have the privilege to, to preaching to multi-ethnic congregations is in the, in, the, in the week of the study and preparing to preach, how do you address that to this mixed congregation? For those who are in the dominant culture, how do you help them to see the other side? For those who are in the minority culture, how do you help them to see that side? And then how do we all come to the table in love? That's the most important thing, is that through the struggle of our misunderstandings, our misgivings, our the racial issues even in the church, how do we deal with that? And still at the end of the day, I have to say, I have to love this person. It's not optional. If I am a Christ follower, I have to love them. So help us here then if, if God calls us to love our neighbor like that. I mean, pastor, talk to us about the power of the gospel. Is the gospel really just your get out of hell free card? Is that what that is? So I can live however I want after I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. That's De it. Definitely. So talk to us about the gospel and how the gospel impacts racial reconciliation, racial strife. How, how does the gospel speak to what we're seeing today? Yeah. Well, I think the power of the gospel, as me and Missy were talking earlier, the, the power of the gospel is like, I, gave, I mentioned this to him, it's like water flowing through the Grand Canyon. Thousands of years ago, they would have saw that water and said, that water is never going to do anything to those huge boulders and rocks. 
And yet over time, the power of that consistent flowing stream of water etched out canals and valleys through that through the Grand Canyon. That's the same thing with the gospel, that the power of the gospel is able to change the most impenitent heart, the most racist heart. And God can do it in his own time and his own way. And so when we look at the issue of racism, we have to believe that because we are individuals, human beings made in the image of God, God, we're part of God's grand plan. He's on his way to doing something. We see this in the book of Revelations. It's not just going to be one class of people or one group of people or one ethnic group there around that throne. It's going to be people from every tribe, language, nation, and people are going to be there. And so we're privileged to be part of this plan that God has, and it comes through this proclamation of what Christ is, what God has already done through his son, Jesus Christ. And that gospel message is to proclaim that, that God is in the process of reconciling sinners to himself and, and you know, taking those enemies and making them friends in that process of reconciliation. And as God is reconciling us to himself, we become reconciled to one another. That's the power of the gospel. Through change people, change people in Christ make, change, make changes. So we really want to see a difference in the ch- change in this racial tension and strife. And I know it's been going on since times began, but it becomes the gospel is the most important part of that, the power of the gospel. That and is powerful. Yes, and I please. think that w- one of the things you said, Pastor Tony, that really strikes me is the call to the work of the gospel, right? right. The work of Christ, the work of reconciliation, the work of repentance in our own hearts, uh, the work of forgiveness. Uh, against those who harm us. But the work of Christ is the work of reconciliation. And uh, I know I'm repeating something I said earlier, but it's this call to the work that should fill us with a drive to pursue, uh, to uncover racial inequalities, cover, um, decide how we're going to use our gifts that God has given us uh, as scholars and workers to dismantle structures of injustice that have been raised up in our lifetimes um, and to do something about it. That is the work of Jesus because we are called to a holy discontentment with these inequalities um, and that is the work of Christ, which, uh, um, yeah. That's powerful. Well, and I love the, uh, the idea to return back to what we, uh, uh, with something with which we began with this issue of sin if it is true that Jesus reconciles, or, or I'll use the language of Colossians 1, 15 through 20, God through Christ reconciles all things back to himself. So if that's true, then even these broken systems that we've built, the Babylons of the world that we've created that are, are systemically built in a way that is anti, and if you're curious about, I'm an Old Testament professor, so I got to Got to throw my Old Testament stuff in there. Listen, it, you get, just read about Babylon, and you can read it about it in Isaiah, or you can read about it in the book of Habakkuk, or you can read about it in some of the other prophets here, or Daniel for that matter. What you see is uh, a, a, a system and a structure built to honor uh, really an idol, and that is the king. And that entire system and the entire structure is dismantled by the power of God. And the power of God just happened to be four Hebrews, Judahites, living in a foreign land. And they said, we're not going to eat the food. We're not going to drink the drink. We're not going to live like you. We're not going to bow to your idols. We're going to do a different uh, way of life. And we're going to speak a different word. And we're going to embody a different kind of community. And if we think about sin, one of the things that uh, I I love about the power of the gospel The power of the gospel reconciles us to God. Christ's blood on the cross forgives us our sins, so we don't have to carry the shame anymore. We don't have to be alienated from God. We can be reconciled to God. We don't have to be alienated from one another. We can actually experience the healing balm of Christ, where now that we can who we once were strangers and enemies to one another, we can be family, literally uh, children of God and the family of God together. And and where, you know, there was contention not only with ourselves but with the world, we can, and this gets to your point, Dr. Dutt, this, this issue of creating different structures 
dismantling those things that are broken and sinful, recreating. God has made us as culture makers. It's just some of our culture is broken in sin, and we as the church have to speak a different word. And that, when I think about the power of the gospel and the work of the gospel working itself through, I think about those four areas, those, those four realities that sin has corrupted and marred, and I realize that in Christ, all of those things can be redeemed, but it's going to require not just words, it's going to require action, it's going to require work, and all of us kind of linking arms together saying, hey, I don't have all the answers, but maybe we can do this together. So uh, with that said, I'm looking at time, and I realize that we've, we've uh, almost, I think almost spent about 40 minutes together, which I love, uh, but I think it's, it's appropriate for us to, uh, uh, to sign off, and uh, before I do so, I, I, I want to give our panelists uh, students especially, and uh, OBU community, I'm going to ask our, our, our panelists to give us a word of encouragement and a word of help and do it in about 30 seconds or, or less. So we'll start with Misael and then move on to Dr. Dutt. What's that? Can you? Sure. I, we can start with you, Dr. Dutt. That'd be great. Uh, okay. I would say as students and lifelong students, scholars, remember that we don't have the whole picture yet. And so to approach these discussions and your friends with humility and ears to listen. That's a good word. I would simply say uh, in regards to what do we do? Where do we go from here? How do you get engaged? How do you get involved in actually helping to bring about change in this process of race and racism that we see in the world? Mercy. Show mercy. Show humility. Takes Jesus. Uh, fellowship got to wash some wounds, you got to go where people are hurting, get next to them, um, and then seek justice. Get engaged and see what you can do to bring about change in the lives of those who are marginalized and those whose lives or backs are up against the wall. That's good. Man, you guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. Uh, my two seconds would be to live in humility and in boldness. Humility knowing who the King of Kings is, falling down on your face to him, but also living in boldness, knowing that that same king lifts you up and says, I have a message to reconcile you and to reconcile others. So go. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us in this chapel service today. I pray it's been a blessing. It's been a real encouragement to me. And uh, well, this is not the only time that we'll be having these conversations. This is an ongoing conversation at OBU. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're uh, working towards is a much more robust, um, more of a, a kingdom community uh, rather than just a, uh, a, what we perceive as, as a normal or by some to be a normal community. We want to uh, image the Lord Jesus in the totality of our community, recognizing that we've got a call to love God, love our neighbor, but also, look, seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God, and we're going to do that together. So a very practical way that you can do that right now is this week, uh, if you see someone walking alone, if you see someone who's down, and uh, if you see someone that you don't know, uh, I want you to go to them uh, introduce yourself, get to know them, have a conversation, listen to their story. And uh, we do this not only because it's a good thing to do, but as bison, you know, bison don't walk alone. So we need to do this together, and I'd encourage you to do that this week. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.